You see, even if we're not actively exploiting the needy, in God's eyes, surely as we examine our consciences, we're far more indifferent to other people's needs than we like to think. Let me pray as we stand. Father God, we pray for you to work in us by your spirit as we listen to your word. Please envision us to care for needs and convict us where we don't. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take a seat. In July 2008, David Cameron, speaking in Glasgow, um, on the topic of broken Britain, which has since become a Conservative Party catchphrase, said this. Our mission is to repair our broken society, to heal the wounds of poverty, crime, social disorder and deprivation that are steadily making this country a grim and joyless place to live in for far too many people. When I speak with international student friends, they're often impressed by the UK's economy and the services, but also quite shocked at the social disorder they witness in society. You see, you can't deny that there are serious social problems in the UK. In many ways, David Cameron is right. Britain is broken. But the question is, what are we as Christians going to do about it? How are we going to respond? Often we respond in these kind of ways. Depression. There are just too many problems, and there's too few of us. We're just overwhelmed. There's not much we can do about it. Apathy. Sure, there are lots of problems out there. But to be honest, I'm not too bothered. As long as my life is good, and we still have freedom to practice our Christian faith, Resignation. There are lots of problems, but you can't change the status quo. I mean, what do you expect if a society turns its back on its Christian heritage? Cynicism. There are lots of problems, and as Christians, we know that we're never going to be able to create paradise on earth. Well, friends, there's a common thread in all of those responses. And that is that there's no vision. There's no vision. There's no vision for God's honour. There's no vision for loving our neighbour. There's no vision for caring for needs. And that's my title for this evening, Caring for Needs. And my aim is very simple. I want to envision us to care for needs. And to do that, we're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 5. So please have that open in front of you, page 401. My first point is this, the problem, God's people are indifferent to needs and even exploit the needy. It's quite a long heading, I'll say it again. The problem, God's people are indifferent to needs and even exploit the needy. That's verses 1 to 6. Now to understand what's going on here, we need a bit of background uh, from Leviticus chapter 25. You can look it up later, so that's verses 35 to 45 in Leviticus 25. Three quick questions from that background passage. Number one, how are God's people commanded to treat poor brothers? They were commanded to support them, to live with them, and to give them work. How are they commanded not to treat them? Question two, well, to not charge interest, to not enslave them and not rule ruthlessly over them. Question three, why were they commanded to do this? Because they should fear God, the one who rescued them from Egypt. Keep that in mind. Let's go now to Nehemiah chapter five. Look at verse one. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. So you've got a picture of people here in desperate need and in his memoirs, Nehemiah then records three representative voices crying out for help. 
Verse 2. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, and our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. Whew. What's the problem there? What's going on? Well, you can see there, there's a famine in the land, which naturally, of course, leads to people being in need. They, they can't get the food they need. But according, the, the point is this. According to Leviticus chapter 25, this kind of situation should be leading to God's people caring for the needs of those around them, caring for the needs of the poor, the problem in Nehemiah chapter 5 is that that is not happening. God's people are indifferent to needs, and worse than that, some of them are actually exploiting the poor. How does Nehemiah respond? He doesn't say there are too many problems, or that their problem wasn't his problem, or that change wasn't impossible. Look at verse 6. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. Nehemiah was furious at what was happening because he hated injustice. He hated the fact that some people exploited others at the very time when they most needed help. How do we respond, I wonder, when we hear about needs? Speaking for myself, I know it's very easy to watch news headlines about the state of education in the north of England or euthanasia, or family breakdown, or care for the elderly. And to feel a sort of emotional distance as we look at those things on BBC iPlayer or whatever. And feel that actually those sort of things only happen in films or to other people. They're sort of problems out there that we don't need to get involved with. But Nehemiah chapter 5 is saying, no, don't stay in your bubble. Look at the problems out there. Look at the needs around you. You see, even if we're not actively exploiting the needy, in God's eyes, surely as we examine our consciences, we're far more indifferent to other people's needs than we like to think. It's so easy for us to live our lives with kind of emotional earplugs which deaden the cries of the society around us. But Nehemiah 5 is saying, no, take the earplugs out Listen, listen to the needs of the society around you. That's my first point. The problem, God's people are indifferent to needs and even exploit the needy. My second point is this, the solution. A godly leader leads God's people to repent in this area. The solution, a godly leader leads God's people to repent in this area. That's verses 7 to 13. So we've seen that Nehemiah was very angry. What did he do next? Uh, well, he took counsel with himself. Very wise. Then charge in there, full of anger. Pause to think. And, and then he says, I brought the charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them. So after thinking about it, Nehemiah pointed the finger at the nobles and the officials because they were the ones who had flouted God's commands in Leviticus 25. Those were the ones in particular who were indifferent to the needs and who were exploiting the needy. So Nehemiah says in verse 8, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they might be sold to us. Silence. These guys know that they're guilty. They don't have anything to say. So verse 9. So I said, the thing that you're doing is not good. 
Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Now, just pause there. Um, It's important to think, in verse 10, is Nehemiah guilty of wrongdoing? What's going on here? Well, just to clarify, under Old Testament law, loans were permitted. Again, if you want to look at it later, that's in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 to 13. So Nehemiah was not wrong to lend money and grain to the poor. What was forbidden, as we've seen from Leviticus 25, was to charge interest. So verse 10 is not a guilty plea from Nehemiah, but just a transparency about his conduct. And that sets him up in the following verses to lead God's people publicly to repent. Look at verse 11. Nehemiah says, Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, We will restore these and require nothing for them. From them we will do as you say but nehemiah is a wise guy um, and understandably he's perhaps a little bit nervous that these um, people who've said nice things in public won't actually keep their word so he wants to make double sure so he goes full on full out and and i called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised i also shook out the fold of my garment and said so may god shake out every man from his house and from his labor, who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. So, that's Nehemiah. A godly leader, leading God's people uh, to repent of their indifference to needs and their exploitation of the needy. Fast forwarding a bit in history, Let me introduce you to a modern-day Nehemiah. For our Indonesian friends here this evening will know him. Uh, His name is Basuki Purnama. He's not the governor of Jerusalem, but since November 2014, he's the governor of Jakarta, which is the capital city of Indonesia. And he's also a committed Christian in a country which is 80% Muslim. Now, I'm just going to read part of a short biography about him, as written by the Jakarta Globe newspaper, And as we read, you'll just see how similar to Nehemiah he is. So here we go. In early 2000, Basuki was forced to shut down his factory after a serious argument with a local official about the provincial minimum wage. He said the official was manipulated by a competitor to sabotage his business. Quote, The official said my fate was in his hands, and I told him I'd rather have my factory shut down than have my dignity trampled. See what that guy's made of, tough guy. Basuki's unpleasant encounter prompted him to join politics. Quote, my father told me that no matter how rich a person is, they would go bankrupt if they challenged an official. So the only way to beat a public official is by becoming one. Why not? My father said, poor people need access to health services, to education. How are you going to help them all? his response, so I decided to become a public official in order to be able to provide health coverage for all. And at the end of that article, he cites Jesus Christ as his model for this sacrificial service. The point I'm trying to make here is that in real life, caring for needs um, doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. It, it, It requires a godly leader or godly leaders to lead a response where failure to care for needs is identified. Now, I think as Christians, and particularly in the West, we're sometimes slow to take leadership in caring for needs because we're inherently suspicious of those in authority. We often hear the mantra, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And while there is some wisdom in that, If you take that line of thinking too far, it discourages Christians from taking on positions of authority for the good of others. We become so paranoid about being corrupted by positions of power 
that we free, refuse to step into positions of power to serve others. See what I mean? Just think about it with Nehemiah. So Nehemiah was able to confront the evil he saw because of his position as governor. Basuki Purnama became a politician to put him in a position to better care for needs and confront evil. And actually, his ambition is to become the president of Indonesia so he can combat corruption more effectively. What about you? What about us? Could you take on more responsibility in society to care for needs? Now, of course, not many of us are going to be called to be politicians, but could we take on responsibilities in schools, companies, local governments, or university societies to confront evil and care for needs? I want to say, if God's calling you to that, don't shy away. The cost of leadership is high, actually. Lots of stress, plenty of criticism, confrontation, yes, plenty of hassle. But we need more Christians like Nehemiah and like Basuki Purnama with courage to confront the evil in our nation and to care for needs. But for many of us as well, I'm aware that God has not wired us to be leaders, and that's great because all of us have different gifts and we serve in different ways. But I still challenge you to think about the social evils of our nation and pray about it. And to help you in that, I'd really recommend this book, um, which is on the resources area at the back, by David Platt. The, the title says it all. Counterculture, a compassionate call to counterculture in a world of poverty, same-sex marriage, racism, sex slavery, immigration, abortion, persecution, orphans, and pornography. So loads of issues there. I'd say re read the book, pray about it, and then choose maybe one or two issues that are particularly on your heart and think about how you can work to confront evil and care for needs. That's my second point. A godly leader leads God's people to repent in this area. My final point from verses 14 to 19 is this. The example, a godly leader uses power and wealth to serve others. A godly leader uses power and wealth to serve others. For the final section of Nehemiah chapter 5, the, the camera shot changes from being focused on this one event to zooming out to looking at Nehemiah's 12 years as governor and his reflections of his time as governor and how he compares to the previous governors. Let's have a look at verse 14. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Does power corrupt? Well, Nehemiah is saying here, well, yes, with the former governors, it did. But not with Nehemiah. Why was he different? Because of the fear of God. He feared God. But Nehemiah wasn't only a man of integrity. He was incredibly generous. He had a really warm heart. Look at verse 17. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for every day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. So imagine there a, like a delicious parish lunch, except with wine, <laughs> multiplied by at least three, probably much more, um, every single day, free of charge, and a public official foots the bill out of his own salary. Nice. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Friends, what a, an example of a godly leader using all his power and his authority to serve others in a countercultural way he could have done exactly what all of the people did before him, what probably everyone expected him to do, 
which would be to use his position to isolate himself from the needs of others and just enjoy a respectable life of self-indulgence. But not Nehemiah. Not Nehemiah because he feared God. And that is exactly the kind of leadership that we're called to and that Jesus shows us. Jesus said, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servants, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't isolate himself from our needs, did he? He came to suffer and die on the cross to meet our deepest need of reconciliation with God. And he's our example for caring for the needs of others. Let me ask you a question. If you could dream a dream, how would you care for needs? How would you use your power, your influence, your authority and wealth to serve others? What kind of charity would you set up? Maybe you can chat about this or think about it as you go back home this evening. What kind of community group or university society would you form? What kind of network would you build up? What kind of business would you start up with the goal of caring for needs? A few months ago I read an article about the Eden team, which are a team of Christians working in a very rough area in Manchester. And one thing they've done is to set up a centre called the Enterprise Centre, which provides ex-offenders uh, with a job and training alongside a home and a supportive local church. And it makes a real difference. So the government probation service sees an 80% reoffending rate within two years. They see a 5% reoffending rate. That's a massive difference. That's caring for needs. What about us in Newcastle? If God has given us money, power, influence, or he gives us that in the future, let's not waste these resources on making our lives comfortable or even more comfortable, but let's go out and care for needs. Now, of course, as we do that, we do need to have realistic expectations. It is naive to have a Bob the Builder attitude to broken Britain. Broken Britain, can we fix it? Well, honestly, uh, broken Britain, no, we can't. Sorry, Bob. We can't fix broken Britain once for all because this world is not heaven on earth. Because we live here, we have sinful hearts, we can't fix broken Britain. And that's why caring for felt needs, whilst it's really really important, it's not enough on its own. People need to hear about Jesus. And that's exactly what the, the director of the Eden team in Manchester has understood. Uh, Andy Hawthorne says, we can forget as a church that no one else is going to share the gospel. We're not going to see society really changed by lots of food banks of debt relief or lots of people living in tough communities as much as those things are gospel imperative. We're going to see society changed by the gospel, changing people's hearts. And that, of course, is right. But that said... Can we care for needs in broken Britain and make a difference? Yes, we can. And God calls us to do that. And it's actually as we obey Jesus' command to love our neighbour and care for needs that people will want to know why we care for needs, which will then open doors for us to share Jesus with them. So, friends, our motto, to borrow from Bob the Builder again, should be, broken Britain, can we change it with our God's help yes we can let's pray I'm going to pray a prayer based on the prayer Paul prayed for the Thessalonian Christians Father we pray that you would fulfill every resolve we have to do good in the society around us and bring to fruition the dreams we have to change our nations so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in us and us in him. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, our final hymn is a song that we sing.